Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for the invitation. I, it seems like there's a little bit of reverberation. Can everybody hear? It seems maybe it's kind of overpowering. Is it too loud? It's maybe too loud. Can I adjust this somehow? Is it better now? Oh, it's better. It's maybe not. Testing, testing, one, two. Maybe that's a little bit better. At least for me, I can now hear myself better. There's no sound. <laughs> testing, testing. Testing, testing. No. Testing. Quantum mechanics never lies, but is often wrong. So as we do the sound check, let me discuss the wind in the room. So if you notice, um, in a house, if you put the fan in, inwards, and you open the window on the other side, what actually happens is it increases pressure. You end up with these pockets of air, so the temperature won't go down very slow. You flip the air around, you flip the thing around, put it out the window, not blowing at you. Actually, your whole house temperature will, will cool down. It's kind of an interesting uh, fact that seemed appropriate as they're doing an audio uh, check here. So let me tell you the story about quantum computer software, if the audio system allows me. And this is a story which is a story that we're writing right now. This is a story that we don't know all the answers to. And so there's going to be four parts of today's talk. Today's talk is designed as a tutorial. So for some people, they're going to be very uninterested in what I'm saying, or maybe they're coming from another field. So the two papers at the bottom are kind of overviews, more philosophical pieces about what's happening right now, one of them in Russia and one of them kind of globally. And there's significant aspects of quantum computer algorithms in each one. And so for today's talk, we're, gonna, we're going to mention one of the most fundamental questions that is in front of us right now in contemporary quantum computer programming. And that's the computational power of low depth quantum circuits. And we're going to talk about some of the known limitations of these low depth circuits. And actually, surprising, surprisingly, little is actually known so far. Um, <laughs> Then we'll talk about this thing, which is this ad hoc model of quantum computation. So the models of quantum computation that we're all familiar with, the gate model, okay, measurement-based model, anionic models, which is actually equivalent to realizing physically a toric code. Okay, for, you know, these, are, these are all interesting models, but what Google can actually do is slightly different. And these subtle differences have to be formulated and studied. And what are the future challenges? Where are we going to go with this? <laughs> so the first thing is we recently have seen this experimental demonstration about quantum computational supremacy. And if you say the word supremacy, some people become offended by that word. Um, so I use the word adversarial advantage, which means that there's two parties playing this game. One has a quantum computer. One has a classical computer. right? And the person with the classical computer has to simulate the quantum computer. And this is a game biased towards the person with a quantum computer. And the question I had was, a very simple question, um, do these quantum adversarial advantage benchmark circuits maximize bipartite entanglement? If you take the system and you partition it on any partition. Um, stated in terms of modern condensed matter physics, does the system violate an area law or does it have um, block entanglement scaling? Right? There's different ways to say kind of the same thing. And we put together a study. We did some kind of analytical results. And I'm starting to talk off with this just to set the stage of where we are and what we're working on. So first of all, the most common systems that are in existence today are, of course, these systems based on transmong qubits, based on flux qubits, et cetera. And they all sort of follow this simplistic model Hamiltonian. There exists an interaction graph which has couplings between the qubits that can turn on and off. Plus, you have some local operations that play the role of gates. Okay? This type of Hamiltonian is very simple. This could be ZZ interaction, I less than J, as we had before um, on the previous talk. There's some local interactions, perhaps an X and a Z. 
Okay? And the interaction graph is essentially the support matrix of J, your coupling matrix of J. I'm putting it into this framework because we don't want to be super specific because most of the questions about the differences between the Hamiltonians for the purpose at the level of the algorithm, you want to be as close to the physical hardware as possible. We're still maintaining some amount of abstraction, at least to make these kind of general statements, which is what we're making today. And feel free to always interrupt me. So one of the things that you don't want is an absolute lack of knowledge transfer, right? There's no purpose of having me here if you're not learning something, right? And if you're confused, it's OK. I was confused. I came up, I said, hey, why are there three junctions on an RF squid, right? I've, like, you know, one of the first jobs I had was modeling RF squids numerically. So ask questions. It's OK. So <clears throat> the interaction graph induces a space-time quantum circuit defined by a tiling on the multiplex from X. So a multiplex is a specific type of diagram. All it is is this. You have an interaction graph. You turn the edges of the graph on in time. And this is called a tiling. And the actual structure is called a multiplex. I'll show a picture of that in one second. And so the tiling is just a gate sequence in time. So in other words, if I have a qubit positioned here, a qubit positioned here, and a qubit positioned here, I can interact these qubits at time one. Okay? Then at time two, I can interact those qubits. Now, if these are positioned in a ring, then I can interact. I don't know why that helps. Maybe there's a little bit of magnetism in my blood. I don't know. I have a high, I'm eating too much spinach, you know, there's too much iron. Then at time three, okay, you could have that. Now, if you connect all of these, and you think of these nodes here, you connect all of those, that one's unconnected. So that's called a multiplex. And that's just sort of a graph with multiple layers. Every layer of the graph has the same number of node nodes, but there's different edges. So that's called a multiplex. So it'll be important in a minute. And <clears throat> please. Can you please mark access on the scheme? Well, time will go up this way. Oh, thank you. Very good. Very good. OK. Now, here's an example here. So for example, let's say your Hamiltonian commutes. So you turn on all of your graphs on the red layer. Or maybe you have to do them in a circle. It's called a round robin in English. A daisy chain is just a line. A round robin connects the start to the finish. I don't know where these words came from, by the way. And you connect everything together on one layer. Then the red on the next, you do local gates. Then you do the next, you do the next. This is called the hardware efficient ANSATs. Let me show you the circuit. Here's the circuit. First, you turn on all the local gates. Those are the U3s there. And remember, those can all be adjusted differently. Then you go around, and you connect all of them in some fashion. There are different versions of this, but this is generally called the hardware-efficient ANSATs. Most of current quantum computer programming, like at Google, IBM, et cetera, they're concerned with these circuits exactly. These are the types of circuits that were used in quantum testing. If this does break, so these are the types of circuits. So the transmon Hamiltonian actually won't realize a controlled Y. It'll realize something a little bit different. Um, the IBM system will realize something slightly different. But for practical purposes, it's essentially equivalent. So you won't get much difference. So going forward, going forward, we have this concept of what can we say about these circuits? How much entanglement can these circuits possibly generate? And this is just kind of a way of thinking for the quantum, kind of the quantum programmer, right? How much entanglement is your system actually generating? Um, so you define bipartite rank. You take your system, you split it in half across any bipartition. The number of non-zero singular values or eigenvalues, which happen to be singular values in a density matrix, that's your Schmidt rank. Okay, and you can have some cutoff, which is some epsilon value. And so those are familiar with condensed matter. You look at your two-point correlation functions, et cetera, and you call it the entanglement spectrum of your reduced density matrices. But in this particular case, we're considered 
We're considering just chopping the system in half, and it's across any bipartition. And the rank provides an upper bound on the bipart entanglement that a quantum state can support. So a k-rank state has at most log 2k e bits of entanglement. An e bit of entanglement is a measure of entanglement that is one Bell state with respect to any entanglement measure. Okay, so one e bit is equivalent to one Bell state. So we use these units. To, we work, we find a way to work dimensionlessly. That's it. It's better this way, believe me. Then the beautiful thing is, um, working in that way, what you have is who knows about quantum circuits, right? So if you work in that regard, if I have a quantum circuit now. Remember, the quantum circuits are these wires that go in time. So it's just like, just like before, but I'm turning it on the side now. So I have some quantum circuits, okay? And then if a gate acts here, it's an RY, okay? This wire has dimension two. It can give you, at most, one E bit of entanglement between those two qubits. Using that simple idea, The question is, what is the maximum possible number of E bits? Well, for a low depth circuit, remember this stuff will saturate very fast. When it saturates, these things will approximate what are called unitary T designs, right? This is a completely different discussion. But for low rank circuits, that's what we have. That's what we're concerned with. And so, just like I said over here, you can cut your circuit in half, okay? If you cut the same number of wires as half the number of qubits, I call that a perfectly balanced circuit. That's the lowest depth circuit that could saturate bipartite entanglement. Let's discuss that. Is that clear? It's like super advanced, crazy argument, but very, very simple math. It's actually a pretty subtle argument. So this is kind of, this, you, you've heard of the area law from tensor networks, right? This is kind of, we're flipping the area law a little bit backwards. And we're just applying it. it this is just a, a tool to think. Could I be saturating bipartite entanglement? It doesn't say that I can adjust my circuit to actually do that. Right? That's a numerical question that I'm actually very interested in. And it should be run on some kind of supercomputer, and it should be done. And there's more mathematics to support that. All it says is that the circuit must be at least this deep to saturate bipartite entanglement. And one of the first things that's interesting is it's geometry dependent, okay? So Rigetti's architecture are these strange kind of rings that sort of hook, you know, it's like six of these qubits and they kind of do this, okay? <coughs> to maximize bipartite entanglement, the Rigetti circuits would actually have to be deeper than the IBM circuits, which is essentially a square grid. It's actually a grid was kind of offset a little bit, but it's essentially a square grid. So that's the punchline, that's kind of the introduction of what can you say when you can't say much at all. You can say at least that. And so this is what we're concerned with. We have very few gates, okay? And I work, what, when I call something low depth, when somebody says low depth, what does it mean? So my definition of low depth is, it is at most the minimal circuit that could saturate bipartite entanglement. And so in our lab, we're mostly studying those circuits, okay? Those are the circuits that you can actually build in Google and in, and in IBM. Now let us have another discussion point before we continue forward. Why doesn't Google demonstrate an entanglement demonstration, right? So I'm telling these guys, hey, look, you have these deep circuits, right? You guys are approximating unitary T designs, right? So the unitary T design is a fancy way to say it's a random circuit, okay? So random circuits should have volumetric entanglement, or they could possess it because they saturate this bound. So why don't you just give me, you know, take the entanglement spectrum of a four qubit state. You can do process tomography on that. Then show me how it scales approximately as you go from four to five to six to seven to eight. How does that entanglement scale? Why do they do that experiment first? Or why don't they just make a big cat state on the whole chip? Right? Do you think they can? It's kind of an interesting question, right? So can they make a giant cat state? And I think, you know, when I talk about quantum adversarial advantage, sometimes I feel like I'm the adversary of these Google guys, okay? And I'll get to that in a little bit more, but 
you know, that's a very basic question. Can you build a cat steak? A big one. You're telling me your system isn't some kind of crazy, noisy system, and it can actually do quantum supremacy circuits. Okay, then here's how much entanglement you guys have to have, at least this much, you could. Okay, so it's another discussion. Okay, so these guys are tortured, right? And one of the roles of the supervisor is you have to find out how much you can torture your students to not discourage them, but to prepare them for their next step of adventure. But the good news is this, okay? Whenever your supervisor says, oh, we're gonna look and we're gonna see this, you know, we're gonna see like a second order phase transition in this system, okay? And if you don't see that, you might get a good publication out of it. But the time period when you're not seeing that in the data, up until the point where your supervisor names it something different, that's gonna be a very bad experience. Right, you guys understand what I'm saying? So what I did is I said, okay, double, it's called double blind peer review. You guys are now on separate sides of the lab. You're gonna write your code over again from scratch. We're gonna make sure this is actually happening. So we'll get, we'll get into that a little bit. But it's, you know, by the way, these guys love me. These are great guys. So um, Akshay uh, is from India. Hari Franz from Thailand. Um, these are great guys. So, <sighs> all right. So how many people here know what an algorithm is? Okay, everybody has some concept of that. Everybody's written some, some Python, something like this, right? So how many people here know what these variational algorithms are that Google, IBM, what they're working on right now? So let me go back to the beginning of how this, let's say, alternative quantum computing stuff got started. Who knows about the adiabatic model of quantum computing? So it was discussed a bit today. What is the adiabatic model? Okay, we'll do it kind of musically. Here's what it is. So I'm going to tell you first that I have a Hamiltonian, which is let's say a one, a one dimensional Hamiltonian, just for simplicity. I could write it like this. I could write H of S. S is a real value, okay? H is some function. And we will say that it's going to be one minus S times an H naught plus S times an HF. S is in some interval zero and one. H, H naught, HF are matrices. <coughs> okay, H naught has easy ground state. HF we want to minimize. Okay, so HF is our problem. Now, what happens is, in the adiabatic model of quantum computation, um, it's been very difficult to analyze the complexity of that model. The first results that were able to sort of recover the Grover speed up was due to Rolland and Cerf, okay? And in their case, they have a K-body projector Hamiltonian as their final Hamiltonian, and they have a K-body projector Hamiltonian as their initial Hamiltonian. Using that, it's a two-body model, and they can basically integrate this thing they get, out the, um, they get out the optimal runtime to change S, S, and they recover the Grover speed up. Fine, okay? In general, here's the game. You slowly tune S. So slowly that you end up in the ground state of that. Thanks to a little bit of mathematics that's existed for a long time, you can approximate Hamiltonian evolution by quantum circuits by unitary propagators. This is even in the Dyson series, right? So what does that look like? Okay, we'll say that E to the negative I tiny t, I'll call it T prime, H naught, and we'll define this thing as U. Then I'll say E to the negative I T double prime, or maybe the same T, but it's very small. HF is defined as V. Okay, so here's how it works. It's like music, okay? U, 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 V, U, 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 V, U, V, U, V, U, V, 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 V. That's adiabatic evolution. But it's true, right? That's exactly what's happening. You're changing the frequency of occurrence and you're extrapolating from U to V. You're extrapolating from U to V. Everybody accepts that. Do you accept that? She's getting paid to accept it. Okay, conflict of interest. So 
U U V U U V U V U U U V U V V V V V. Okay, done. Why? Why am I singing to you? This is why. This is why. What if? What if? Instead of this mess, and I keep using this like a microphone. You ever notice that? What if there's a shorter path that violates the adiabatic theorem and still minimizes HF? What if a little tiny circuit like this, and I start to adjust it? Okay, well, <laughs> that's where we are with our theory, and I'm going to give you a little bit of that. So that's the algorithm that Google's studying. Okay, what Google has is you alpha 1, V, beta 1, U, alpha 2, V, beta 2, dot, 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 dot. Okay? These things are adjustable. Okay? The circuit is shorter than the long adiabatic circuit. So one of the early jokes I used to make was like, oh, it's going to be super fast as long as we're super slow. Right? So adiabatic quantum computation is the type of computer you have to move very, very slow to do something very, very fast. It sort of is a contradiction. This one is you have a short circuit, and you have to tune that circuit. And so the question is, how do we tune it? How do we tune it? So let's go to the next step here. So you see there the u of k, the u of 1, okay, all of that stuff. Well, it's just one of these things here. It's all the same stuff. And what I want to do is, I want to vary these things to minimize my Hamiltonian. So that H right there, that H, that's just my final Hamiltonian. Okay, and this thing right here just encodes all of these degrees of freedom. This is called QAOA, QAOA. Okay, who has heard of this? Everybody's heard of it, right? If you're on Twitter, they talk about that. We talk, I talk about this on Twitter. Okay. So that's all it is, right? That's all it is. It's a hack job version of the adiabatic algorithm. Okay. Now, what is the variational state space? This is a way of thinking. It's going to be very, very important for the experimentalists in the audience because as you build this stuff, I mean, the Russian quantum roadmap is damn serious, right? These guys are going to build some stuff. Okay, we got people around here, you know, you, these guys are building something. What are you going to build? You have to build some algorithmic things. So the question is this. What is the variational state space, which is what I call this? This is just the set of all accessible states that you can prepare experimentally. So you go to your lab, you have your tunable things. It works with optics too. It's the same stuff. You can tune all the knobs in all possible configurations. That's your variational state space looks like some weird thing mathematically because it doesn't form a vector space necessarily. It, the topology of it might be a little bit strange as well. It depends. It depends on a lot of properties. That thing has to be used to minimize your Hamiltonian. But there's something more beautiful than that. So that part we all accept. We'll go, we'll go back and it gets more beautiful as you go. So this is, this is a new way, a new model of computation. It's a different thing. Right? So what truthfully happened was, this is a true story, don't tell anybody this, okay? <laughs> These guys, which are building quantum computers, were like, hey, government, all I need is a zillion dollars. So I remember there was one time where it was like, we need a zillion dollars to build a quantum computer. Sort of the first time DARPA, IARPA, they got involved, okay? That didn't work. So they said, oh, give us five zillion dollars and we'll make one clean qubit, one error corrected qubit. That didn't work. Then, you know, the field almost died a couple times. It was like some sequestered. We all remember this, right? They even like cut my, it was like crazy, right? I was like, okay, this is not going very well. Then suddenly, Google doesn't care. They're rich. And they went from sort of two qubits up to about 10 or something. Then everybody got excited. Then it was sort of this like, it was like a feedback loop, right? And they told everybody, all we need is to build a quantum computer. And we have all these wonderful algorithms. But the truth is, 
the stuff that we're building and the algorithms we have are completely different. They're not connected at all. I'm showing you a different model of computation. We don't know the power of it. So I'm giving you guys the building blocks. I put down these definitions because these definitions didn't exist. You think these guys at Google are able to do that? They're not, actually. <laughs> okay? they're, you know, they're, they're good at like one application. Okay, and I love, I love, I love saying things about. They actually, well, I, w I won't get into, but you know, many, many former postdocs in my group are now at Google, so it's a good relationship actually. But their quantum software team. Let's say that many of these questions are not being addressed at the company, so the academics have to attack them. We're like the black, sh black ship papers, right? So now, here's the beautiful thing, right? Look, I apologize for many of these things. It is what it is. This is really what they're doing. Okay, so we want to minimize. We want to minimize over, these are the parameters you have in your lab. This is a vector of parameters that you can actually tune somehow using whatever you have in your lab. And you're trying to minimize this with respect to these parameters, okay? This is an expected value with respect to some state. Very basic quantum mechanics. This is equal to the minimization over, let's say, we're now going to do a sum, and we'll do just say a j dot sigma. Okay. This is now going to equal to a minimization summation. We'll put the coefficient out front, call it j twiddle. Maybe some strange notation here. But the point being this, this goes to the quantum computer. This is a real number. So example, x, x plus alpha, y, y. These are now sigma matrices. So I'll say sigma, 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 sigma. OK, I prepare a state. I measure x, x. I prepare the same state, I measure y, y. I do it epsilon times, I have precision. I do it one over epsilon squared times, I have precision epsilon. Polynomial, woohoo, right? That's how they think. So <clears throat> the alpha comes in what's called the convolutional step. That just means we sum it up at the end. We can make this average by only measuring y, y by only measuring xx, these are individual poly measurements. The state preparation is independent of that. Then I can do a feedback loop. Is it clear? Is it actually clear? This would be the first time it's actually clear then. So there's actually some success today. Better than snowboarding. So <clears throat> that is their model of computation. That is their model of computation. And so you take a Hamiltonian, you minimize it term by term. You simulate the terms by measurement. Very beautiful, actually, very beautiful. But totally different than other models of quantum computation. So the first question I said was, can you simulate a quantum circuit with this model? That's an interesting question. We'll talk about that one later. And so, the first thing after defining this model is I notice that many of the papers in the quantum computing literature have exponential cardinality, which means when you expand it in the poly basis, there's an exponential number of terms, which means by definition, your, your algorithm is going to take exponential time. <laughs> okay? And so we called it a bounded objective function. It means that you have some subset of all possible, you have some subset that is polynomially bounded. So that was the first thing where I was like, oh, that's interesting. And so depending on your physical system, so remember some people in this room, they work on optimal control theory. We have a couple papers on optimal control theory. My former, former guy that was a senior research scientist in my lab for a number of years, he became very famous all of a sudden, at least he has a couple famous papers, because he hooked actual optimal control code to Jorg, Jorg Wutstrup's NV centers. And so George was super happy about this because you, can, you basically can do whatever you want at that point. And he was, he was really the first guy to sort of hook it to an experiment. And in the optimal control problem, you're given a bound on these functions. 
and you're given some Hamiltonian terms, and you have to sort of solve this problem. The way I formulate it, it's more like a geodesic. The way other people formulate it, they use these things called GOAT, and they sort of look as a minimization problem. Fine. Variational quantum computation is now positioned to remove the, one of the bottlenecks of optimal control. You can do the optimal control in CITO. On the chip, you don't need to simulate it first. This is powerful. We can discuss this a little bit later. Number two, from a more abstract point of view, these are just products of gates, right? Just like that variational ANSAT circuit. Now, going forward, one of the things that we must understand is, and I know that many of you do understand this, is we prepare the state. The reason I'm using a Cartesian product there, okay, is because these states are prepared at different times and they're not correlated. So when I use my quantum computer, I prepare a state. Then I have to make a lot of measurements in many different bases, and I have to do it again. So this is a significant overhead. But it doesn't require phase estimation and these other components that are in traditional quantum algorithms. Okay? So all that means, all that notation means, is I prepare the state multiple times. I measure it multiple times. And this interplay between measurement and, and creating the state is what the quantum programmer is now supposed to work on. And so we say that a quantum state is accepted by an algorithm if you evaluate this Hamiltonian and it has some value that's less than, let's say, a spectral gap. Okay, we just call it accepts. And this goes into sort of what I was writing here. It's just saying that you can, you can do anything with these Hamiltonians and you can calculate any property of them provided um, you can prepare states and you can make those local measurements. Now, minimizing them is a different question. And so, the thing that we'll discuss now, are there any questions about this? It's kind of exciting, right? So it's not every day you say, hey, it's not every day somebody says, look, what Google's doing is not quantum computing, it's this different model. We don't know if it's quantum computing, right? So I have evidence in favor of it being quantum computing. If I assume that this thing is fault tolerant, we can basically prove that this model is universal, okay? We have arguments against it, okay? We don't know how much you can, you know, if you have a very short circuit, how much of your Hilbert space can you approximate? Are there hard problems in there that, you, that can't be done classically? Well, in that class of problems, if anything exists that is interesting, the precursor to that is quantum supremacy, right? That's the first step. So quantum supremacy, all it is is you're just setting random numbers on your circuit, you're running it, and then you create some probability distribution. You have the classical computer reproduce that probability distribution. Okay? So can you tune those values in and measure an objective function such that you can minimize an objective function better than you can classically? Now that we have the model, you can actually ask the question. So I don't know what questions they're asking. They're asking questions about chemistry and stuff. So maybe that's, that's good as well, but you know, we, we, have to sort of, we have to sort of understand. And the other thing is this. Most of the theoreticians in the field that were able to do this stuff were about 10 years older than me. And they ran for the hills. They're doing their own research still. I'm one of the only people dumb enough to basically go right after what Google's doing. This is a true thing, guys. So right now, there's not much of a community right now. There's only a few groups that are actually doing this on the academic side right now. It gets you guys excited about this because there is a lot of prospects there, right? And it needs to be a big community, and I think the Russian community, because of the mathematics background, it's pretty well-skilled for this. So I encourage people, and some people are crazy enough to take that encouragement and run with it. So <clears throat> who knows what satisfiability is? You don't count. Anybody else? Okay. So satisfability, it's determining truth conditions on Boolean functions. You want to find the input of a Boolean function to make it output one. The type of satisfability that we will do is we'll have a function. So a function has a type. We'll say that it's the Boolean n tuples of Boolean numbers. Okay, we'll actually just write the whole thing out. Zero, one. And, and we'll say that these are functions into R plus, and we want to minimize over X
And this is equal to, let's say, sum f naught. That's in, in the reals. So the three satisfiability is a type of constraint on the form of f. Okay, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize these functions. The minimization of these functions um, is what you typically encounter in an optimization problem. The decision version, like this p versus np problem, this np com np complete problems, those are given as decision problems. In that case, you're given a version f, and you have to decide if it is satisfiable or if it's not satisfiable. In most of the real world, though, we just try to minimize f. So for example, you're having a wedding. Your uncle hates your aunt, and your aunt hates everyone, and so nobody's ever going to be happy no matter where you sit them. Right? So you try to minimize this constraint. You put the aunt over by the, you know, by the dogs or something. I don't know. So you try to minimize these constraints. Right? That's real life. Okay? And that's, that's the problem. So, you know, as, as you actually rightfully said, um, and we'll show you some data for this, solving the Ising model exactly, we have this thing called the Zorro supercomputer where I work. And this is 104 GPUs. I think we solved 34 spins exactly. It takes like the weekend to do this. That's exact. Approximate, we can do it in three seconds. But for one particular thing we were working on, approximate wasn't good enough. We had to know for sure because we were looking for a phase transition. We said, hey, you know what? It could be some signature in the algorithm. We have to know for sure. Then suddenly we're like, oh, well, exact solutions is a disaster. But approximate's easy. You could do approximate on your laptop. And actually, they turned out to be pretty good. So k satisfiability is as follows. You take some variables, which are Boolean variables. Let's call it x or y and we'll say z, and you form these together and you form them into products. We'll say x2, x1, y5, z7, plus, et cetera, et cetera. The number of variables in each term is going to be 3. The number of products of variables is, is the number of clauses, OK? And the total number of possible variables is big N. That's the number of variables. Then we define what will turn into something like an order parameter. We define the density. What is a density? Density is always a ratio. The ratio of clauses to the number of variables. It's called the clause density. So let me ask you this question. If I were to dream up randomly three sat formula, one clause, can you, can you assign values for one clause to make this satisfiable? Always, yes, you can. For two clauses, for three clauses, well, it will become more difficult to satisfy all the clauses. I don't know why that works. It will be more difficult to satisfy all the clauses. It will be more difficult to satisfy all the clauses if you have a high number of clauses, right? So for example, let's say I have 1,000 variables. 1,000 variables, and we'll, we'll cover this next. So 1,000 variables, and I pick three variables randomly, and I negate them at random. That's always satisfiable. Those three variables is always satisfiable. What if I have 1,000 variables, and I pick a million clauses? It would be very unlikely that I would randomly pick a million clauses, and it would be satisfiable ever. Correct? That's the intuition. So what happens in the middle is the interesting part. So firstly, we can embed this problem into a Hamiltonian. With ease, just believe me that that can happen. Okay? You just write down some projectors. It's three body. You can turn it into two body. Everything can go into the Ising model. That's fine. You can program this into D-Wave. And going back to what we were saying before, which is similar to what I've already written on the board a little bit, we're trying to basically, we're going to be trying to set some values here to minimize this type of function, but this function is just going to be a Hamiltonian. Okay, so this just shows 
that you have this constraint problem, which is called satisfiability, and it can be embedded into the quantum computer. That's what this is showing. Now, there's something missing here, and it's my fault. That's why I have a pen. Do I only have one marker? Because it would be good if I had two colors. But I don't want to complain. Thank you very much. What about red? Oh, it's hard to see? Uh, it's better. OK. We'll use black for now. OK. This is going to be clauses. I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to go forward a little bit, right here. Clauses per, clauses per variables. Clauses per variables, clause density. So how many variables should we have? Let's say number of variables, let's say 10,000. So it's big, OK? Then we're going to go here. We're going to say one clause. It's going to be something like right here. OK, and maybe put some ticks here. We already said before, if I have one clause, it's always satisfiable. So up here, we're going to have percent sat yes. OK, so if I generate a clause at random, how, what percentage of them? Let's say I generate a million of these things. What percentage of them is going to be satisfiable? If there's one clause, it's always Right here, two clauses, same thing, almost always, almost always, almost always, almost always. Suddenly, this happens. This right here, something like 4.27. The exact number doesn't matter. And this was not my finding. This is a famous finding from 1992 where statistical physicists first got into computer science in one of the ways that they have done that. They've done it in several ways. This can be explained using ordinary statistics. We basically made the argument, right? If you just start taking, you start sampling from some kind of uniform distribution and you say, okay, how likely am I to get something, get a function out with, with some property that makes it so it's unsatisfiable? You can actually do that mathematically, and you can predict that, you know, the limits are easy to predict using the arguments I just said. And this thing right here is a true story, okay? I'm at, I'm at uh, Queen Mary University, and I was like, oh, you know, this is like contested in the literature, you know, if, if it's actually known if this is a phase transition or not. And the guy stands up in the background. He says, that's my paper. It's not contested. And I was like, apparently, it's been resolved. So, you know, and then the guy stays. He says, you can't make this up. OK, I was like, all right. So apparently, some people, are st some people believe. So the guy that wrote it thinks it's legit. This is a 100-page paper. I didn't care enough to read it, because I could spend six months on this. Now, the exact location of this doesn't matter. For 2SAT, it's absolutely analytically known, and that proof I can follow. And this is like 10 pages, so you can follow that proof. This is fine. Here's the part that is bizarre. This is the strange part. I would, I would have bitten this if not for the coronavirus. You would just watch me pull that. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to get corona in front of you. Runtime. Runtime. Does something like this. Blows up right there. That is empirically observed. We don't have any reason for that. But for some reason, and I'll tell you the story about nature, OK? There used to be these crazy people. By nature, I mean the thing that we exist in. So there used to be these crazy people. There's, there's this thing called uh, you know, um, undecidability. Okay. So if a problem is undecidable, 
means there's no computer algorithm to decide that problem. And it turned out that even in the three body problem, you can embed certain versions of this which are undecidable, okay? So people used to say, well, I'm gonna build an experimental system and it's going to solve undecidable problems. But every single time they've ever tried in the history of humanity, physics is like F you. It's unstable, okay? And so this, the fact, so we, we believe in the infinite limit that all the hard instances of this NP complete problem are concentrated there. And we believe that every algorithm will exhibit a slowdown that's exponential at that point. If it doesn't exhibit an exponential slowdown here, then P is equal to NP. And most people believe that there's a law of physics presenting, preventing that, okay? We, it might be outside of our formal system to be able to prove that, but that's what people believe, okay? So, fine, fine. Now, interestingly enough, there is the optical parametric oscillating group in Japan, NTT Labs, and my students who are actually complaining about coronavirus, and I was like, papers come first, gentlemen. They're going to Japan, they're gonna be probing this on a real physical system for the first time. D-Wave actually can't do this because it doesn't have enough connectivity right now. Okay, so this is another discussion. I'm not gonna bore you with that right now. But we had an interesting negotiation. I was like, are the airplanes closed? Is NTT closed? And they're like, but what? I was like, guys, come on. Papers come first, right? It's the same, it's the same students, by the way. Now, Google, and this is hilarious, okay? This is the funniest thing you're ever gonna see. So, QAOA, right? Like, I wanted to understand the limitations of QAOA, okay? So, we had these tools. This is a huge discussion in the lab. Okay, we're working on this, we're working on this. Uh, I said, okay, guys, look. Approximate the energy across the phase transition, and you should basically make the observation that there is some kind of, you know, there's some, like, sort of level of difficulty that sort of increases across that transition point, right? We weren't really sure what it was, what was what we were going to see. But here's the problem that we did see. We found hundreds of papers in the literature, hundreds of papers in the literature that were over here saying, ooh, it works so great. Now, analogous to Claus density, you could think of the number of couplers that you turn on versus the number of qubits, okay? So interestingly enough, right around here when it's, when it's one, the approximation starts to get worse and worse of your ground state energy. All of the experiments to date, most of the random numbers, when, you know, when you're, when you're working in Google, you're working in like Xanadu, I love Xanadu by the way, but let's be honest. And they say, oh, I'm gonna statistically generate a bunch of random instances. So we weren't, we weren't the first person to do this I don't know why the other people missed it. I don't know, but we'll, talk, we'll tell you what it is. This, is. this is very, very important. The stuff in the literature is all over here. In the words of statistics, these are not representative. They're not representative of true problems. For a fixed depth ANSATS, energy approximation gets worse with increased clause density. First weakness of this algorithm that was very much spelled out in kind of a transparent way. You guys might have also heard about these barren plateaus. This is a different discussion and it's not really, this thing exists with or without those. It's independent of that. So this finding is very good and so the students, even though they were tortured, they got a PRL paper, which is pretty good for students, right? Especially for a theory paper. So we're proud about this. It should come out, I think it should even be out now. I don't know, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Um, the, so the paper's there, it shows that the performance of QAOA exhibits strong dependence on the density of the problem instance. And here's the trouble. If you want to build that experimentally, think of it this way. As density goes up, the distribution of your coupling strength increases. Harder to build experimentally. Harder to build experimentally, right? Because Obviously, if you have one frequency scale over here, then you have other frequency scales that are vastly different, then that's going to be very difficult to build experimentally, and that's what that shows. And it also shows the other thing, which is very important. 
the problems that they've been testing this stuff on are easy. This is where the easy ones are. They're easy. They're always satisfiable. They're easy to solve. In, la in the language of physics, if you plot degeneracy, degeneracy, this starts off highly degenerate here, and it goes to non-degenerate. Okay? Highly degenerate ground states are easy to find, right? Completely non-degenerate ground states are harder to find, so it's intuition of it. Let's keep going. Are there questions about this? So, look, I don't think it definitively says that what Google is doing is absolutely wrong, right? I just think that it says that they cannot ignore the fact that there is actually a significant limitation on this. And in addition, the 100 people, which we didn't reference them, not because we're trying to hide it, but we didn't, like, attack them on our paper. We just said to the, let, to the editor, okay, and these guys were worried. They sent it to three reviewers. Every one of them loved it. Okay, so maybe this is actually important stuff. I think it's important. I really do. So, going forward, you know, I've just sort of said, look, I don't think this is going to work. Now we have a number of questions that are coming out. So this is like Gen 2 of this study. And how much more time do I have? Half an hour. That's the worst word you've ever heard in your life, because it's like, even, even, even I'm like getting boring listening to myself, OK? So, but the first part of the talk was very good. So, OK. So I just told you that this thing kind of sucks. And now I'm going to tell you that this thing's kind of universal. But what do I mean by that? Let's not even use slides. Let's go back. Welcome, friend from the RQC. So, Let's go back and let's just ask a question. What's the simplest way to prepare a Hamiltonian such that if you do minimize it, the output of the Hamiltonian will be the output of a quantum circuit? Simplest versions like this. What is the problem I'm trying to solve? I'm trying to solve the following problem. Arg min over your variational state space of H1 is equal to, let's say, the span of U0. So you end up with, this is a ray in state space, you end up with something on that. But if everything's normalized, then you get something proportional to U. And so that's the equivalency class up to global phases. Right? That's what that symbol means. Okay, so we're all speaking the exact same language. What is the problem? What parameters? What parameters? Oh. They're in the state. They're in the states. The Hamiltonian's independent. Because we implement the Hamiltonian as a measurement. Then we combine it after measurement with the real value coefficients in the convolutional step. Okay? Now, what is the problem? The cardinality of H1 is the problem. This scales as an exponential. Exponential terms in that Hamiltonian. So you're going to make exponential measurements to mimic it. Unfortunately, much like I told you over here, there's a bunch of whacked out stuff in the literature. <laughs> this thing has been used like crazy. Especially quantum machine learning. It's packed with this thing, right? And I don't know. I mean, that's just all I have to say about that. There's not much more you can say. So how do you solve it, right? So this is what I wanted to do. I was like, okay, look, this is just nonsense, okay? I don't want that. Now, first of all, everybody understands this is, this is a non-degenerate ground state. There's two energy levels. The upper state is degeneracy. You know, if it's 2 to the n minus 1, there's, there's a unique ground state. Okay, how do we solve that? 
So that's the question. Maybe I'll leave it here for a minute. So that was the first question. And so we agree that this is a valid, I've lost something here, oh, here it is. We agree that this is a valid question, right? So the research question is, can I create, can I create a Hamiltonian, if I minimize it, it can simulate the output of a quantum circuit? Seems like a valid question, right? Is it a valid question? Please ask me if you don't understand the question, because it's a very valid question. I want to minimize a Hamiltonian. When I minimize it, my machine knows how to produce. So basically, hey Stoss, we want to learn in your lab how to control your system. So we find a control sequence such that it will spit out the output of a quantum circuit. That's what we're doing. That one won't work because it takes exponential time. So you can't simulate quantum computing with that. So it can't be universal. So the strategy, the strategy is, it's convoluted. It's a little bit convoluted. So we got thirty, we got thirty minutes, and I'll show you part of this that we're doing, and this is an interesting part. It's kind of food for thought, right? Food for thought. And this isn't some kind of like great thing that you can't possibly under. It's not like that. It's just it takes a little bit of time. So the students that are you know, working on theory of quantum computing right now, it's a good paper to read, actually, because everything's kind of defined and kind of lined up. And it's actually a funny story behind this paper. So you know, I got a couple friends in this one journal. I won't use the name of the journal, but it's one of those, like, in order to be on the advisory board of this journal, it's like kind of a big shot thing. So I got some friends. I sent it there. It goes through. It goes to my buddies. They sent it out to a few crazy reviewers. And they said to me, all of them were like, hey, it's not technical enough. You need to define everything in a series, right? So I define everything. I send it back. Then it gets desk rejected because the editor, the lead editor says, oh, this is too technical now. <laughs> Wonderful, right? It's a history of life. So the first thing is this. We'll talk about that. So the first thing is the, first thing is the following. The only part that matters is this. Uh-oh. The only part that matters is this. So we want to prove that if we minimize a Hamiltonian that we have the output of a circuit. So what we need to do is we need to say that if we have a gapped Hamiltonian, we put conditions on our Hamiltonian. We say the Hamiltonian has a gap. We say its ground state is non-degenerate. Okay. Under those conditions, we can upper bound and lower bound how much overlap that ground state has with the quantum circuit. So in other words, if we went to the top experimentalists and they said, look, we can't get to the ground state of the system, but we can get below a value delta, OK, that's OK. We have control over that. It's called the stability lemma. Things kind of like this already existed in quantum chemistry. All right, but if you're good at inequality, you can prove this in you know, a day, fine. All it says, if you get an approximate ground state, that's enough. That's the point of that. Now, the first construction to remove that is very, very simple. I write down a Hamiltonian H naught. I do a sum over I, and I have projectors I projectors. So this is a local Hamiltonian. It's a local Hamiltonian, right? Just like a local Zs. Just think of it as local Zs. It's the Dickey basis, right? The Dickey basis. It's easy. So H naught times x acting on x is equal to the one norm of x, and x is a bit string. So it's a Dickey basis. It's non-degenerate. You can prove that very simply. And so this thing automatically will satisfy the stability lemma. Then you think of, for physicists, you think of Heisenberg, in Heisenberg evolution. 
we all remember that Heisenberg evolution is isospectral on your observables. In other words, the spectrum of this is preserved under conjugation by matrices. So these nice properties translate into a new set of eigenvectors with the same eigenvalues. But the beautiful thing is, here, this guy, if I expand this, well, what does it look like? It's a giant product. And this scales with e to the n, or approximately 2 to the n terms, just exponential terms. So it gets rid of that by just having a simpler term right here. The second thing, which is very, very important, is the following. Well, the cardinality will blow up if these are non-Clifford gates. The cardinality is an invariant under Clifford conjugation. So in other words, fix, call it h prime, c equals k. Then, Okay, so in other words, and this is very interesting, actually, this is very interesting for a number of ways. The number of, Ham your locality of your Hamiltonian terms under Clifford gates, you could think of exactly integrable, like integrable models, exactly solved spin models, right? You could look at, for example, this model here. You could, trans you could transfer this with a Clifford circuit. If you look at, you know, for people trying to, there's some people in the room right now, they're trying to build, um, cluster states. Well, there's something called a cluster model, which is three-body. You just act on it with some Hardamard gates and some local c naughts. You turn it into a three-body model. Actually, you can very easily turn one-body terms into a k-body term. The locality can change under Clifford gates, but the cardinality, the number of terms in the sigma basis, is an invariant. Okay, and that's an important feature. By the way, this construction, as it is right now, and obviously this is supposed to be the quantum circuit, it has exponential dependence. The cardinality has exponential dependence on non-Clifford gates. So in order to get around that, we still have to have another construction. And so the final construction, we actually turn to something when I, I won't cover this in full detail. So for those people that are like, I will give you the punchline of kind of this area of research and sort of what we're doing. For those people that are truly interested in this, and there'll be a couple people, right, that are interested, I'll be, I'll be glad to go through this with you. And the punchline is, we go back to this thing actually that was invented in Moscow, okay, by Alexei Kitev. It's called the clock construction. And originally it actually came from an idea from Feynman. Okay, so the Feynman model, it's actually a very nice model. Okay, what he does is he has an electron clock and he hops gates on this and he's constantly measuring. So he has this model. This is Feynman's idea. So we do U And so what it is, it's a cloud of, of qubits. This is where u acts. And then down here, we have one electron. And this guy hops that thing around. This guy hops that thing along the line. And what happens is you look down here, this is going to be a very strange looking eyeball. OK. So there's a. That's like an Egyptian eye, OK? It's looking, it's measuring this guy right here. So Feynman was like, hey, it's a ballistic computer. You let it evolve. 
and you just smack that last electron out, and then the state of your register prepares a quantum state. It's a genius idea, actually. He came up with this in like 1982. Feynman did that. Katev made a penalty function where he embedded this into the ground state, and he kept track of it. It's called the history state. Now, I used that history state. I modified this Katev Feynman thing a bit. Actually, in some you have to fairly you have to know what's going on to modify it. And so the final output of this is that variational quantum computation. Remember, here's the thing, okay? Don't misunderstand the statement. First of all, in the real lab, Google, they can only build a low depth circuit. I didn't prove that super low depth circuits are universal. You need polynomial depth to be universal, right? Low depth is not polynomial, okay? It's bound by at most linear, according to my definition. So I didn't prove that. That's probably not true, okay? So what does it mean then? It means the following. It means that this really strange dance where the experimentalist prepares a state, a bunch of measurements happen, I calculate an objective function classically, then I define some new parameters to prepare a new state. It means that feedback process represents a universal model of quantum computation. That's what that is. Now, you'll say to yourself, well, this is an optimization problem. What are you talking about? How can an optimization problem be defined like that? Well, the definition of the circuit itself defines a solution to the optimization problem. Sometimes I don't like the rules, but those are the rules, so. <laughs> um, now, kind of going further, actually, I think Alexi's in the audience somewhere, embarrassed, probably, by this talk. But going further, some questions of practical significance. Okay, so why is this quantum machine learning stuff so kind of exciting, right? Well, this model that I just described, it fits well with the idea of machine learning. Machine learning is really about minimization of functions. It's about feedback loops and kind of iterative processes. Now, of course, neural networks, et cetera, were not covered in this talk. But these ideas, these concepts with this variational quantum computation, it's actually very closely linked to machine learning for reasons that um, we won't get into fully in today's lecture. But if you want to learn a little bit about it, you can take a look at those. This is still in review. And I'd like to open it up to questions. And usually I get some very good questions. And so I think that today there will be some good questions. Is this? I think we made it, yeah? Beautiful questions. No, guys, I've asked the dumbest question. I asked, why is there three j junctions on an RF squid? And my first job was to simulate an RF squid. This was literally my first job that someone paid me for, okay? Before that, I was a math tutor. I was at D-Waves, really. So I come, I was like, hey, think about that for a second, so. Yes, I ask, again, the question you asked at the beginning, so why did not Google make a cat? And so I have various kind of answer, but I would like to hear your answer. What was the question, sorry? Why did not Google make a cat to demonstrate supremacy? Honestly, I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that. I think that the speculation is probably good to just sort of, so there's probably going to be even a phase transition of, of how legit people think they are at some point, right? Right now, they seem to have kind of gotten ahead of the wave. So here's one thing I don't appreciate. Quantum adversarial supremacy. It's like I tell my friends that do error correction. You know, and I got many friends that are mathematicians, as you can imagine. I say, well, what errors are you correcting? These are not even, these are imaginary errors on paper. <clears throat> IBM attacks Google. The two sentence takeaway is Google's wrong. There's a, there's a conflict. No. The truth is, IBM said 
you could probably simulate it using this other computer if you added more memory to it. But if you don't add more memory to it, you've done nothing because the game, the rules are already there. Google picks one random circuit, creates a plot, which is the output distribution, sticks it in a file, does another circuit, same thing, makes a bunch of these. Then the adversary with the classical computer has to reproduce these plots. Unless you reproduce the plot, Google wins. For 45 qubits, they can reproduce the plot. For 53, they can't. That's it. So I don't know why Google didn't create a cat state. I don't know. But I also don't like what IBM did in response to Google. Because, you know, the, game, the game's clear, so. Does not answer your own question. I, can't, I can speculate. Why didn't Google create a cat state? Probably because they can't. Yes, so this, this is my yeah. point. Do you think they can or they cannot? And okay, if they cannot, why don't they cannot? Uh, I, I have some say, idea on that, but I would like to hear you on that. Let's say this, OK? Inside the depth of circuit that they create, you do have the depth to create a cat state. OK? Cat states can be done with linear depth, right? Every qubit has to interact in a chain. So like this. Right, the depth of that is linear. They, they could, they, in principle, at least on paper, they could. So from a physics side, please tell me why you think they couldn't do it. No, they have 53 qubit, and they don't have 53 depth. The, the depth is less than that. No, that's the number of. Is it? Yeah, I think it's uh, 30 or something like that. Yes. So that would be a problem then. So OK, so in that case, then, that, the, then the cat state's outside the depth. So by the way, not in all of their experiments, the, the, the last experiments they did with a 20 qubit block where they were warming up for this, they could absolutely do more than 20 qubits deep. OK, so they, they, they didn't create a cat state on that either. So why did I, I repeat my question. But there are other reasons. Oh, wait, OK, so that's my dear. That was a beautiful question, though. I like that one. It was good, though. Um, what are the cat states for qubits? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Meow. So if anyone really didn't like the talk, I apologize, but I did my best. So it's over now. <laughs> oh, man, there this guy, there should, this there should a be, question. There should be at least one dumb question, so I'll, oh, I'll do my best. So I, I, I didn't really understand the, the last part of your talk. So you said that the, the Hamiltonian, which was written there, is not good enough because it has, like, what exponential number of Okay. So in order, for, in order to make the Hamiltonian experimentally, you have to simulate it with measurements, which means you have to write it in the Pauli basis. Yes, yeah, so it has if, an ex exponential number of terms in the Pauli basis. Yeah, and I call that and cardinality. You, okay, and, you, and the, then you prove that you can simulate an arbitrary quantum circuit with, a, so, with something of polynomial cardinality? Yes. For every unitary matrix whatsoever? On paper, yeah. Because I always thought that, for example, if you take like a random unitary matrix and you try to decompose it into. Uh, 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 the gate model is defined with, yeah, a, with a polynomial depth circuit. So remember, there's the, the decomposition problem, for example, if I take. So it's not an arbitrary it's not unitary. <laughs> ah, then it's, it's not it's, an arbitrary unitary. It's an matrix. arbitrary quantum circuit. Ah, it's, an arbi it's a polynomial depth quantum circuit. Right, so my construction introduces polynomial overhead in the depth of the circuit. Okay. It's a good question. Remember, the decomposition problem, so for example, on average, most states are probably easy to prepare. But is there a state that, you, that takes exponential depth circuits to prepare? This is a very hard, these, are, these questions are totally different than what I did today, but these are actually very interesting questions. So, um, you know, this goes into like the, the theory of random quantum states, right? It's a different question, though. Okay, let's
Thank you. Thank you.